to that chapter that we read a few minutes ago. We're in the 8th section of Isaiah, and it's 46, or chapters 46 to 48. And this section deals with judgment upon Babylon. Last time, a couple of weeks ago, we looked at judgment on their idols in chapter 46. And now this evening, we will look at judgment on the nation as a whole. And then next time, God willing, we will consider the consequence, which is liberation for God's people in chapter 48. This chapter divides into three simple sections. It is the judgment announced, verses 1 to 5, the reasons for the judgment in verses 6 to 10, and then the helplessness of Babylon in the time of judgment in verses 11 to 15. The announcement of the judgment, the reasons of the judgment, and the helplessness in the judgment of Babylon. Matthew Henry notes in introducing this chapter, he says this, that ruin is here in this chapter largely foretold not to gratify a spirit of revenge in the people of God who had been used barbarously by them, that is the Babylonians, but to encourage their faith and hope concerning their own deliverance. So let us consider first of all the judgment announced in verses 1 to 5. We'll notice five things in these five verses. First of all, it is, in a sense, a shocking announcement. Verse 1 says, Come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Sit on the ground. There is no throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for thou shalt no more be called tender and delicate. What a shocking change. When God decides to judge a nation... There is absolute contrast, shocking contrast for uh, the nation that God judges. Calvin notes in verse 1, he calls her virgin not because she was modest or chaste, but because she had been brought up softly and delicately, delicately like virgins and had never been forced by enemies. But now she will receive her just judgment. It's shocking, but it's also servile. In verse 2, this one who ruled the nations is turned into a slave. Take the millstones. One commentator notes that the, the millstone or grinding in the mill was given to the, the least of slaves. In fact, quite often it was a form of imprisonment. Take the millstones, grind meal, uncover thy locks, make bare the leg again. The idea of being given to work, nothing to do with making yourself beautiful. Make bare the leg, uncover the tie, pass over the rivers. Again, Calvin says, these are the marks of the most degrading slavery as the meanest slaves were formerly shut up in a mill. Not only is it shocking and servile, but it is shameful. Verse 3. Thy nakedness shall be uncovered, yea, thy shame shall be seen. I will take vengeance, and I will not meet thee as a man. There is shame promised to Babylon in the third verse. It will be seen by all. It will be vengeance that will be clearly not just a human experience. It actually will be clear that God has met with this nation. Because none less than God could bring this judgment upon Babylon. This nation that was going to hold the people of God for 70 years captivity would itself now come into shocking servile and shameful servitude. Fourthly, it is solemn. Verses 3 and 4. 
I will not meet thee as a man. It is the Lord of hosts, verse 4. It is the Holy One of Israel. As we have said, this is God meeting a nation. One of the things that's surprising about the times in which we live is not the response of the world. It's the response of the church in a sense. As if we are taken as much by surprise at these events than the world is. When we pray for years for God to intervene into the world and then when it happens we are uh, surprised. God is doing his work, his strange work in these days and we are not to be like the world as if perplexed at what is happening. Yes, the world that does not believe in God, that is perplexed. The atheistic world is perplexed because it thinks it is in control. This is exactly the point with Babylon. Babylon will be perplexed, but the people of God are being told even over a hundred years before the event, Babylon at this point has not even taken the people of God captive and yet their captivity is being prophesied in advance. Why? Because it's our Redeemer. It is the Lord of hosts. It's, it is God who is speaking. It is God who not only predicts these things, it is God who performs these things. It is God's work. So not only is it shocking, servile, shameful and, sh and solemn, it is the sentence of the Lord. Verse 5. Look at God's sentence in verse 5. Sit thou silent. This is God's sentence. Sit thou silent and get thee into darkness, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for thou shalt no more be called the Lady of Kingdoms. That is God's sentence upon Babylon. And Babylon represents the enemies of God. Specifically, the religious enemies of God that we see from Genesis all the way through to Revelation. Babylon represents the, the armies of Antichrist in that sense. And this is God's sentence against his enemies, and against the enemy of his people. It is sit in silence. It is get into darkness. And it is a removal of all that she thinks of herself, the lady of kingdoms. Thou shalt be no more called the lady, the beautiful kingdom. The, the elegant kingdom. You will no more be elegant. You will be shockingly turned into a servant. You will be brought down to shame by my hand and by my sentence. Therefore, the church is not to be surprised. The church is not to be perplexed. We are not to be caught unawares like the five foolish virgins. We are to be like the five wise virgins who are prepared when their Lord comes. And that is not just on the last day. That's even in times of judgment because we were talking about this yesterday. Um, in AD 70, in a sense, Christ did return, not fully and finally, but he returned in judgment upon the nation in that time. We are not to be surprised. We are not to be perplexed because God has told us we are prepared. The, the having the oil filled speaks of preparation. And the way this goes back actually to this morning's sermon, the way we are prepared is by being in the Word of God, sitting at the feet of Jesus, so that we are not taken by surprise at these events. So that is the judgment. Announced, And then, secondly, the reasons for the judgment. And there is five reasons in verses 
6 to 10. The first one is their treatment of God's people. Yes, God was wroth. It says, I was wroth with my people. I have polluted mine inheritance. Yes, God has done this, and I have given them into thine hand. But the judgment, here's the interesting thing, just like Assyria. Just like God speaks of Assyria, that they did not realize that they were God's servant, and therefore became proud and arrogant, Babylon shows no mercy. Thou didst show them no mercy upon the ancient hast thou verily hev very heavily laid thy yoke. Calvin gives an amazing illustration on this. He says it's like a man giving his child to another man uh, to uh, chastise the child and the one that the child is given to actually executes the child. Instead of chastising the child, he puts the child to death. And that's what God is saying regarding Babylon. I, I gave my people into your hand to chastise them, but you executed them. And you dealt with them much more harshly than what was right. You showed them no mercy. And even the old, the ancient, you put a heavy yoke upon their backs. The spiritual Babylon does this. Because the spiritual Babylon is human religion. And we read in Acts, don't we, of the apostles, it says, you put a yoke, you put a, a burden on the backs or the shoulders of the disciples that neither we nor our fathers have been able to bear. So their treatment of God's people is the first reason. But then secondly, their pride in themselves. Verse 7. Their relationship to God's people, verse 6, now their relationship to themselves, they're proud. Thou saidst, I shall be a lady forever, so that thou didst not lay these things to thy heart, neither didst remember the latter end of it. We live in a day of pride, don't we? Where pride has become a positive thing where people have pride in their sin, rather than sin bringing shame, which it should do, and I'm not just talking about one sin, I'm talking about all sin. Sin should humble us and should bring shame upon us, rightfully so. But as Romans 1 tells us, a time will come, and indeed it has come, when not only will they commit sin, but they will love sin, as the last verse of Romans 1 tells us. Pride, and then thirdly, third reason, self-sufficiency. Verse 8. Therefore now hear this, thou that art given to pleasures, that dwellest carelessly, that sayest in thine heart, I am, and none else beside me, speaking like God. Only God can say this. Only God can say, I am, and there's none else beside me. But, but you are putting yourself in the place of God. You are claiming self-sufficiency for yourself, for a creature of the dust. I shall not sit as a widow, neither shall I know the loss of children. We live in an age that this is the heart of many. We don't need God. Why don't we need God? Because I myself am my own God. I'm able to do for myself whatever I want, and I can protect myself from whatever trouble is around. And these are the reasons. You see, in a real sense, sin per se, if I can, I want to be careful what I, what I say here, but in a real sense, it's not just sin that brings judgment on people. It is our response to sin. I'm a sinner. Well, what am I going, what am I going to do? Am I going to be humbled? Am I going to be ashamed? Am I going to confess my sin, acknowledge my sin to God? Or am I going to boast in my sin and actually glory in my shame? 
this is why God brings judgment upon Babylon. And this is why the Lord had to bring Nebuchadnezzar down to eat grass like a beast. To show him, not only that he was just a man, but to show, to show him he was less than a man. When God brings us down and shows us our sin, he does a gracious work to us. Never feel that it's a, a bad thing that you see your sin. That's a work of God's grace. That's a work of God's mercy. To show you your depravity. To show you the ugliness and the, the iniquity of your heart is a work of God's grace. For the reprobate, God leaves them in their shame. But not only their treatment of God's people, their pride and their self-sufficiency, in verse 9, fourthly, it is for their satanic practices. In verse 9 it says, But these two things shall come upon thee in a moment, in one day the loss of children and widowhood, they shall come upon thee in their perfection. Why? For the multitude of thy sorceries, and for the great abundance of thine enchantments. Again, this applies to today, doesn't it? Just like in these times, we see the advancement and the, the promotion of satanic and witchcraft practices. So you open the newspaper or the internet or, or whatever, or you listen to the radio or the TV, whatever it is, and all these different things are promoted. The worship of Satan, the worship of self, rather than the worship of God. Notice it is the multitude, not just one or two sorceries, it is the multitude of thy sorceries and the great abundance of thine enchantments. We cannot worship the devil and worship these satanic practices and hope to avoid the judgment of God. You see, we will either follow the Lord, or we will follow darkness. We will either live in the light of Christ, or we will walk in the valley of the shadow of death. Which is it for us? But then fifthly, not only is it their treatment of God's people, their pride, their self-sufficiency, and their satanic practices, it is their trust in their sin. Not only are they not ashamed of their sin, but they trust in their sin. Look at what it says in verse 10. For thou hast trusted in thy wickedness, thou hast said, none seeth me. It's exactly what people are saying today. God doesn't see me. I can do what I want. I, I can get away with my sin. It says in, in verse 10, thy wisdom and thy knowledge have perverted thee. To be perverted is to be twisted. Your, your thinking is twisted. Your thinking is perverted. You think that you can get away with your sin, you can boast in your sin, you can glory in your wickedness, and you think that there is no consequences. This is perversion. This brings us back to our point. It's not sin per se. It is the reaction to sin. It is the response to our sin that God is here highlighting. You see, we're all sinners and maybe the, the children of the devil take some refuge or solace in the fact that the children of God are also sinners. But you see, that is not the point, is it? The point is not that we're non seeth me the reasons for judgment and then lastly the helplessness of Babylon in the time of judgment verses 11 to 15 and they are helpless in four ways not five like the last two they're helpless in four ways first of all they are helpless in their knowledge verse 11 helpless in their knowledge Therefore shall evil come upon thee, thou shalt not know from whence it riseth. Apparently Aristotle uh, reported 
according to John Gill, that Babylon had been taken for two days and some of the city did not realize that it had been taken. Therefore shall evil come upon thee, thou shalt not know from whence it riseth, and mischief shall fall upon thee, thou shalt not be able to put it off, and desolation shall come upon thee suddenly, which thou shalt not know. No, and you see, Babylon boasts of its knowledge, boasts of its wisdom, but here the knowledge is of no help. No help to Babylon. And, and surely in this, God is judging the nation by even showing them that all that they trust in is without help in the day of trouble. And then secondly, there's no help in their sorceries in verse 12. Stand now, and as Theodore of, of Cyrus in, in the 4th or 5th century says that there's sort of this irony here. There is, you know, there's like a, a sarcasm. You know, stand with your enchantments, and with the multitude of thy sorceries, wherein thou hast labored from thy youth, if so be thou shalt be able to profit, if so be thou mayest prevail. It's a bit like what the prophet does with the priests, of Baal. You know, where is your God? Is he gone on a journey or, or whatever? Here is holy sarcasm against the witchcraft and satanic principles and practices of the nation of Babylon. Bring them forth. Stand now with your enchantments, with the multitude of your sorceries. What help will they be to you? No help at all, of course. And then thirdly, no help in their astrologers. We know that um, in, the, in Daniel, the king brings all the astrologers, all the wise men, because that was the, the thing to do. Bring forth all the, the stargazers, the, the astrologers, and so on. But look what verses 13 and 14 says. Thou art weary than the multitude of thy counsels. Let now the astrologers, again the sarcasm, the, the challenge continues. Let now the astrologers, the stargazers, the monthly prognosticators stand up and save thee from these things that shall come upon thee. These are the ones you trust in. Behold, they shall be a stubble. The fire shall burn them. They shall not deliver themselves from the power of the flame. There shall not be a coal to warm at, nor fire to sit. Before, in other words, will be burnt up in their judgment. All of God's wrath will be focused and forced upon them, so much so that there will be not be a coal left to warm at. God will pour out his complete wrath and vengeance upon them. Rather than being helped they will be completely destroyed in the judgment of God. This is the word that's used in Revelation. That the, in Revelation chapter 20, it's uh, the devil and his angels, they will, be, uh, they will be destroyed, they will be literally ruined in the day of judgment. And all that trust in such things. Their merchants cannot help them, finally, in verse 15, thus shall they be unto thee whom thou hast labored, even thy merchants from thy youth. They shall wander every one to his quarter. In other words, they'll leave you. None shall save thee. The helplessness of any false religion to help. On the day of judgment, one of the things that will be a shocking revelation to the religious of this world, the false religions of this world, is that everything that they trusted in will depart from them. But we have a Savior who says, Never will I leave thee. Never will I forsake thee. God is our refuge and our strength. He will never depart from us like these merchants. 
He will be help, not like the astrologers who are helpless, who cannot help the people, neither themselves. God is our sure help. He is our rock, our refuge. As Christ said in the words of Christ this morning, his word is like a rock that even when the winds and the waves and the storms come against us, we are sure upon the rock of Christ and his word. False religion is helpless. Christ is our sure help. May God bless his word to our souls. Amen. Let us sing from Psalm 46. Psalm 46. God is our refuge and our strength in straits of present aid. Therefore, although the earth remove, we will not be afraid. Though hills amidst the seas be cast, though waters roaring make and trouble be, yea, though the hills by swelling seas do shake. We'll sing Psalm 46, verses 1 to 5. We'll remain seated to sing. <clears throat> God is our refuge and our strength in straits, our present aid. Therefore, although the earth remove, we shall her remove the Lord to her and help her will and that right early prove. Father we, we bless you we give thee all the thanks and the praise that thou art a sure help so different from the empty and vain helps of this world and even of false religion especially a false religion that cannot help anybody and shows its weakness at the very moment that it is needed. False religion sucks the life out of people. Christ breathes the life of his spirit into us and Christ has covenanted with his elect people that never shall he forsake us. O oh Lord, we bless thee 
we praise thee that thou hast proven thyself to us in many ways at many times and lord even the fact that we are still able to stand before thee is a testament to thy grace and mercy father we would have forsaken thee many times we have many times but thou hast remained faithful thou hast remained true to thy promise and we rejoice in a love that will not let us go a love that has drawn us by the dying and death of jesus christ and a, a love that has justified us by the resurrection of christ we have risen with him by the power of his grace and spirit and the day is coming rather than being brought to shame we shall be brought to rejoice in the god of our salvation the lord jesus christ that has triumphed over the grave the one that has led captivity captive that has broken open the bars of hell, the gates of hell, is building his church, and the gates of the devil's hell shall not prevail against it. Antichrist is crushed. Christ is exalted. False religion is a shame. Christ is our glory, and therefore God forbid that we should glory except or save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. We give thee all the glory, all the praise, all the honor, for thou art worthy, thou art our God, our Maker, and our Savior. We worship and we bless thee. And the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the love of God our Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.